Szanowni Państwo, witam serdecznie na... Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to a discussion organized by the Pilecki Institute, a discussion entitled War in Ukraine. Uh, with us today are Hanna Radziejowska, the head of the Pilecki Institute in Berlin. Uh, we are also joined by Professor Piotr Madajczyk of the Institute of Political Studies at the Polish Academy of Sciences. Uh, Dr. Marek Budzisz, uh, Dr. Łukasz Adamski and Marek Budzisz. Uh, the debate will be moderated by Mateusz Werner from the Pilecki Institute, I think. Uh, today we all have the impression that we've woken up in a new Poland, a new Europe. It's definitely a dark day in the post-war history of Europe. So I would like us to uh, discuss what happened today um, and also to talk about the future and the past. A good evening. Uh, War began in Ukraine uh, this morning, early at dawn, and it's a very emotional moment for us Poles and all over the world, but our duty is not only to be compassionate to the Ukrainians, to help them uh, materially and politically, we also have intellectual obligations. Our experts should uh, be able to help us understand what actually happened and what follows from it for us, for our future, and what we should therefore do. I propose to start in medias res, and I would like to direct my question to Mr. Marek Budzisz. Why did Putin decide uh, to invade Ukraine on a full scale? So choosing the most radical option, the most dramatic and risky option, which experts had deemed the least likely. Is it really the case that Putin could not have achieved his aims via other means? Did he really have to employ those most drastic measures? I think that we essentially have two answers to this question. A short term or medium term answer, and one pertaining to a longer. Uh, those included all kinds of internal and external pressures by using Russia's influence in the Ukraine. Uh, he was unable to take over political control of the Ukrainian state. And the provisions of the so-called Minsk um, agreement were supposed to achieve that goal. Uh, but when Putin realized and I'm, I'm really um, giving you an abbreviated version. When he realized it wasn't working, he opted for aggression. But we need to ask, why did he opt for aggression and what is Putin's aim? Because I do not believe that his purpose is only to um, seize control of Ukraine in the political sense. I don't think Russia is capable of occupying such a large country for a long time. In fact, even Putin Putin's uh, speeches indicate that that was not his aim, um, including the speech he recorded two days ago, which was publicized today, in which he did openly say, and that's how the speech was constructed. Uh, most of it was devoted to NATO and the security order in Europe and to a lesser extent, and only in the final part of his speech uh, did he refer to Ukraine? Uh, Russia sees Ukraine as a necessary condition on the way uh, to dominate the European 
the security space and the fact that Russia is employing military pressure only shows the types of tools that they will resort to in the nearest future. If we were to uh, construct a hierarchy of uh, Russia's goals, Russia wants to neutralize Ukraine, um, not to say that it wants Ukraine to have neutral status, it essentially wants to strip Ukraine of its agency, of its statehood, and in that sense, uh, to seize political control of Ukraine and military control. Uh, Putin needs this in order to demand a new a status, a new security status in Central and Eastern Europe, in the Baltics and in the Balkans. And it's quite uh, clearly stated by Russia in recent weeks. Finally, if Russia attains that goal, it is the opinion of most Russian analysts and politicians that the aims um, of NATO as a pact which does not guarantee multilateral security will be put in question. And through this, Russia will pursue its next aim, that is to do away with NATO and to push America out of Europe. Because that seems to be Russia's main strategic aim. Uh, pushing America out of Europe if they succeed, that's another issue. In the Russian master plan, this will lead uh, to the creation of a new European security space. And due to the differential in, in military potential between Russia and Europe, in the Russian, from the Russian perspective, this would mean that Russia would ultimately decide Europe's fate by introducing its own order, not always antagonistic, but also imposing certain formulas the way Putin did in the Die Zeit article, where he painted this, depicted this picture quite clearly. Why does Russia need all this? Well, in its long-term strategy, Russia needs it to balance uh, the growing uh, domination of China. The Russian elites believe that by 2030, um, they need to seize control of Europe, um, tap into Europe's economic and political potential, tap into Europe's capital resources in order to construct a certain political conglomerate which will be able to rival or balance China's power. So I think that ahead of us are not just weeks of tension, but years of tension in uh, Russia and West relations, because Putin has simply launched, uh, begun to pursue his long-term strategic aim, or even his historical aim, the way he understands it. What has he done in Russia? He's destroyed the opposition, changed the constitution, destroyed the independent media, um, controlled uh, elections to the Duma, uh, which uh, took place last year. These are all elements of uh, a plan that was set in motion in early spring of last year. And Russians, uh, Russian officials have stated this openly. Ukraine is one part of this plan. It's a necessary condition uh, to take the next step, but it's not a goal in itself. That's my view. But wasn't it the case that the Biden administration actually wanted uh, to get out of Europe, uh, transferring Europe into Germany's care, the care of Germany, uh, which has great relations with Russia, as seen in the Nord Stream 2 pipeline? pipeline. Why does Russia then need a war uh, since everything was essentially going its way? Um, its strategic aims, and you say that was uh, to push America out of Europe, that would have happened anyway, uh, gradually. But ultimately, it would have happened. I don't entirely agree with your assessment. First of all, I think that Russians attach too much weight to the military factor. 
uh, they believe in a bit of a caricatured way uh, that the strongman wins in the international arena, the strongman, i.e. the one who has the troops. Um, to a lesser extent, it means economic power because they've developed a certain theory of uh, uh, the short-term war. Um, essentially, economic potential is not necessary if war is not to last months and years, but only weeks. So Russia believes that it's America that matters in Europe. That's why Petrushev at the last Security Council a meeting uh, said that we need to talk, you need to talk to the Americans and not to the European countries, um, which he spoke of disdainfully. And this is really a, a, a recurrent theme in the speeches of Russian officials because they believe that America uh, is capable of imposing its uh, will on Europe and they believe that Biden's policy rests on two pillars of, uh, first of all, in Asia on an alliance with Japan and in Europe on the alliance with Germany. And in their view, of course, there are tensions. America will be able to maintain its control. And so they do not really believe that that's at least that's the way I interpret things. Uh, they believe that they can um, bring about the disintegration of the West by removing America. They also believe that certain fundamental changes to the international order are us usually come about as a result of war. Karaganov uh, speaks of this openly. He recently said that in the coming years, Europe perhaps does not face a big war, but a series of small ones uh, because the small, it's the small wars that alter the international order. And according to Moscow, the international order changes because the balance of power changes. And that also answers why Putin opted for the invasion now, because he thinks he's stronger now. He's determined. He has a modern army, uh, whereas the West is unprepared. The West has been discussing since 2014. They haven't done much. Uh, to ensure their safety and time is of the essence. Um, that's my opinion. So, so I believe that Russia wanted to um, pursue a create a, a preemptive strike, and and that's essentially what Putin is doing. And he probably believes that he is in fact defending the Russian Federation against danger. Przed wtargnięciem Rosji na teren Donbasu było rysowanych wiele scenariuszy rozwoju. Well, before they entered Ukraine, a number of scenarios were drawn. Well, we can mention important characters, Mike Sowonin, Andrei Waryonov, who argued that the war would not happen, that Putin is bluffing, and that must be due to some kind of links with Biden administration and so on and so forth. Now, today it seems that after the Russian army has entered Ukraine, we know a little more about possible developments of the situation. Could you please share your views on that, which development, which scenario has been selected by Putin? Well, I think the developments that we have seen over the past dozen hours or so seems to present a consensus amongst the uh, military analysts and that is, they believed that first, we are going to see airstrikes by means of air force and missiles in order to paralyze Ukrainian air force and air defense, which are significantly weaker than the Russian counterparts. And at the same time, assaults will be mounted in the back territory of the enemy in order to 
take over uh, the key pivotal points. Now, a large scale, an all out invasion will only come after a possible success of the first stage of the operation. So the objective of the first stage was to destroy situational awareness, um, destroy um, signals, communications links, um, the destruction of uh, command hubs. That is when the military ceases to be an organized body, organism, and can be reconfigured according to the circumstances. They become a mass of um, the army and equipment, uh, but it is really not uh, navigable. Uh, reminiscent of the Polish situation back in 1939. Has that been successful? It, it doesn't seem so. A very clear line of thought in the Russian opinions on that matter, but they were saying that that was not going to be an, an easy war, but it would seem that Blitzkrieg was something that uh, the Russians would want to attain in Ukraine. The Ukrainian state is relatively weak. They would think and that the state institutions would implode. It seems after a dozen hours or so, that these expectations of Moscow are proving to be impossible, at least they have not yet materialized. So I think this is going to further intensify the Russian activities, possibly a larger force to be yet deployed in the developments to come. Dr. Wukash Adamski. Uh, Gleb Pawlowski uh, in the uh, echoes of Moscow said to the Russians, get ready for a defeated war. And his vision that he painted in the conversation said, once the war is over, the Russia loses the war and there will be no coming back to the status quo uh, from before the assault. Now, what can that mean? If these words come from a former advisor of Putin and collaborator of the administration, do you think that the entry of Russia into Ukraine, would that entail the exclusion of Russia from the European community in the large sense of the word? Well, that would mean a moral and political exclusion uh, from the milieu of civilized states that abide by the international law. Well, allow me to note that in, a, in contrast to the euphoria that was seen in Russia after Russia occupied the Crimea, now we see small protests and these are easily pacified, but you do not see that much of, of euphoria Well, it's good to have seen the protest actions um, taken in Russia, but let me note uh, the importance of the meeting between Putin and the Russian Security Council. Now, the question arises, why did Putin decide to humiliate Naleshkin in public? Well, he is his loyal and powerful ally, head of the intelligent service. Well, he, he performed in a number of posts over the 20 odd years of Putin in government, but why did he need an explicit consent from all members of the Security Council? Now, these meetings has always been behind closed doors. It would seem that Putin was highly tensed, highly strained mentally, and he decided to share the responsibility for this crime of aggression with various Kremlin factions. 
And also, it seems that he wanted to cement support, galvanize support uh, for this action. Now, there are many factors at play, of course, and this would perhaps be an internal factor at play. I could also mention a pan-Russian nationalism as an important consideration. I, I do believe it is there, and I'm, I'm convinced that that historic Russia and the Russian Federation are two different entities, but it seems that now Russia has a title to the former Soviet territories, and that the Russia today is an art of, you know, the, the emergence of the Ukrainian state is an artificial state, uh, which emerged due to the Polish agitation and fomentation, and that uh, the separatists, the Russian intelligentsia, their, uh, their interest was not duly reflected, hence they set themselves apart in a separate republic. So they believe these lands are historically Russian lands, and therefore Ukraine is part of the Russian national territory. So going back to the question, why did Pawlowski said what he did say. Well, he's an intelligent man. He's been distancing himself from the regime for quite a while now. And amongst the known propagandists of the Russian state, you can see that uh, the characters that I do know personally, and they are generally known journalists, experts, you, you do not see much enthusiasm on their part. Uh, they seem to live in anxiety, uncertainty. What is it that is going to happen next? And it would seem that uh, not all the military embraces the Putin um, a vision. Let me remind you of an appeal made by Natsilov, who is a nationalist, a former general, who warned in his public appeal, he, he warned the Russian Federation authorities against the road of aggression. Um, the road which was once taken by the um, era of the Third Reich. He even mentioned the uh, demise of Russia at the end of the process. If Russia does not abide by the international law, the Crimea, now Donbass, now that taken together suggests some kind of possibility of an internal power game, power struggle. The uh, successor to Putin is also the question to be asked and um, the possibility of Russian Federation to be fragmented. Uh, this is what the Russian elites fear. So what is it that should be done in order to increase the internal cost of the operation for Putin? It would seem that um, they would want to stop the war uh, and that it is in their interest. Well, I would say that um, the policy of um, um, well, respecting the civil society would not be warranted. Uh, you know, the good nation and the bad tsar, going back to the 19th century uh, idea, but the entire Russian society should pay a price for its political naivete, because they have a leader uh, who commands huge uh, armament and military power. Well, the man who is really not accountable, someone who cannot be predicted, unpredictable perhaps, uh, is running 
of the state, how to interpret him. Now, you, you did mention the response taken by the West, but it is not a monolithic approach. We could see a varied approach or varied approach is taken vis-a-vis -vis to Putin and Russia and Europe. You, we could see Germany with Nord Stream 2 project. Let me ask another of our experts, Hanna Rajewska and um, Piotr Madajczyk, experts on Germany. What lies behind that collaboration, the collaboration between Germany and Russia to support and strengthen Putin? Well, uh, who should uh, give it a start? Well, but let me first ask uh, Hanna Radziejowska to uh, speak on that, please. No, we are near the Brandenburg uh, Gate, and I saw the congregation of the Ukrainian diaspora, and now, only, only just now, there was a big rally attended by, by many Germans, Poles, um, Ukrainians, Belarusians too. And I must say, we are experiencing a certain shock in Germany. On the one hand, there's huge anger on the part of the Ukrainians, Poles, Belarusians too. And uh, today I had a chance to listen to the representatives of the Ukrainian diaspora who are shouting out, we are enraged. We've been saying this for years, that Nord Stream, that, um, that Nord Stream should have been blocked as a project. And uh, I remember many rallies uh, to this effect. And I met um, Richard Herzinger, who has been a longtime correspondent of Die Welt. And he told me, listen, it is, well, he, his, his narrative would be very much Polish, quote unquote, if you like, which is very rare in Germany. And that is exactly how he spoke out uh, in uh, the German media. But he did say it is worse than I thought it would be. It is worse than Poland expected it to be. It is going to start very soon. And he says that Putin would always announce what he wanted to do. And us, ordinary people, we could see through it. It was only obvious. You do not really need some in-depth political science behind you. It has been clear for many years now what this is all about. And yet nobody gave it credence. And uh, Putin in his first statement a few days ago uh, when he commented on the history of Ukraine, you, you could see an utter hatred vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine uh, to the Ukrainian state, an independent democratic state of Ukraine. It is a very important factor. We are talking about strategic considerations here. It's all very well, but Germany and some other Western countries have ignored these statements. He said, Putin said he would not like to see independent Ukraine, free Belarus, or democratic Baltic states. And the whole philosophy uh, of uh, not selling arms to Ukrainians, this is exactly the expression of that approach. We, we, we want to take care of peace. We stand for, for peace. And I remember I woke up about one minute before uh, the war started. And until now, sanctions have not been levied. And I cannot quite understand that. A number of hours have, have elapsed. And we are in an international team here. 
Uh, there is always someone coming in asking for help, friends for Belarus or Ukraine, trying to support their families or bring them in here. We need to see the whole complexity of the picture. We are talking about Lukashenko regime as well. And whatever is happening now comes as a big shock. And then where are the sanctions? What is the response? Now, Putin says what he's going to say, to do, he actually does it. And what is it that we are going to do about it? Can we stop him? The discussion on the sanctions is not only about the severity of the sanctions, but also about the speed of reaction. How fast can we react uh, to this situation? A final point from me, perhaps, um, related to the institutional practice. Please note that our embassy in Kiev is still operational, that um, a number of places have been made available on the borderline. This shows the readiness of the Polish state. If you look at the response by the Czech Republic, for example, I think, I hope that we as European Union community, as NATO community, I hope that we are going to be able to respond adequately. We'll see. But whether and to what extent are we will be successful uh, in winning this war. Well, Putin was quite, quite vocal about what he thinks about uh, the countries of uh, Central Eastern Europe, and he needs to be stopped. This war needs to be won. Uh, Professor Madajczyk, let me repeat the question about Germany. Uh, what does it mean for Germany that Russia has invaded Ukraine? And what does it mean for people like Gerhard Schröder? who was um, an ambassador of sorts uh, to Russia. Uh, he was uh, the icon of Ruslan first day and uh, those who understand Russia in Germany. Uh, what does it mean to them? And those who uh, sought to appease European public opinion saying that Nord Stream 2 was a purely economic enterprise, that it had nothing to do with politics or well, it wasn't initially. Uh, what Dr. Adamski talked of, um, the moral break with Europe uh, that Putin undertook, um, is it visible in Germany? Has Germany, have the Germans realized by now that maintaining uh, this soft relationship with Russia, with Putin's Russia, is cannot be reconciled with the ethos of European values. That, yes, the Germans have opened their eyes, they've awakened, but it's uh, a late awakening because when looking at Germany, I've always had the impression that it's uh, quite a strange mixture, politically speaking, a certain very highly idiosyncratic political culture shaped by uh, a certain uh, political history. Uh, slogans like uh, never again, uh, a bad army, uh, a, a strong army is uh, not a good thing. In fact, discussions still continue about this condition of the Bundeswehr, which was quite neglected over many years because a civilized a nation doesn't need a strong military after all. Uh, and where um, military parades uh, sparks protests. Uh, people could not conceive how uh, soldiers could appear in the streets and celebrate something. So this is uh, a German uh, specificity. Uh, we are guilty for World War II, but our, uh, our sense of guilt uh, focuses on Russia. Our guilt focuses on Russia. At the same time, uh, that this uh, specific political culture was mixed in with very brutal economic interests. And it's worth uh, keeping in mind as we've uh, we've been referencing Nord Stream 2 uh, all this time. Uh, let us not forget that Nord Stream 1 has been active, operational for quite a long time. It's quite obvious. I just read today that Nord Stream 2 has ceased 
uh, to be a topic. Uh, let's now move on to Nord Stream 1. But this, up till now, this was quite an obvious thing. It was never even mentioned in discussions. At the same time, it seems that grave mistakes were made on the macro-political level. Since there's this holy slogan of energy transformation in Germany, so climate, climate change is in vogue, and all of these beautiful slogans that one readily identifies with are all based on one assumption, the delivery of energy from Russia, or whatever is happening. So essentially, we might say, so returning to the question uh, put at the beginning as to what stage uh, German politics is at currently, I think uh, Germany is now facing this pile of broken glass, uh, the, the debris of those beautiful assumptions, those beautiful slogans, which have proven um, to be a fiction, uh, wishful thinking. Uh, Schultz's visit to Moscow clearly showed that he was merely um, um, a background actor. He had no influence and he was treated as such by Putin. Jak się patrzyło na niemiecką politykę, ale to chyba nie jest niemiecka specyfika. And we could add uh, that Germany have has projected their own um, assumptions about politics onto Russia. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'd like to dwell on one matter. You said that Germany became involved in economic cooperation with Russia. Uh, thereby strengthening Putin in the long term. And it wasn't just Schroeder, but there was Angela Merkel. Of course, uh, the oft repeated declarations that if we are doing politics in, in Europe, it's, it is inevitably with Russia. We're always um, friends with Russia, Putin's Russia. This does not follow from history. If it was a, just about history, then Germany should uh, have kept uh, should have been very cautious about cooperation with Russia. And this isn't only understood in Central Europe, but it's quite obvious. I think that it followed from an imperial policy of sorts. So Berlin looked to Moscow, Moscow looked to Berlin, the two strong countries. Uh, Germany was supposed to lead the EU. And I think this was the background. I don't see why not guilt towards Poland where it should have been placed. So I think that there were more factors that impacted Germany's uh, view of Russia. Uh, Germany sees itself as the strongest nation in Europe and has a very traditional outlook. Um, a traditional view of Moscow and Russia. Um, to, to, to respond, well, the, the, this is a topic for another discussion. Why is German guilt focused on Russia rather than a Poland? Um, even if we um, don't, don't mention Poland, the Ukrainian ambassador uh, recently said a German guilt should be divided between Russia, Ukraine, and a number of other countries in the former of the former Soviet Union. But it's a fact that Germany's guilt have focused on Russia. When Germans spoke of guilt, uh, they felt guilty uh, towards Russia, which gave them a mandate to give Russia special treatment. I also mentioned the ruthless economic interests as vested in Nord Stream 1 and 2. The assumption there was that if these pipelines connect Germany and Russia, uh, Germany will be the hub uh, from which energy will be distributed all across Europe. It will be at the center and of necessity, this will also 
uh, fortify Germany's political position. So, yes, of course, both of these areas are connected and overlap. Uh, but then again, if you looked at German politicians, I didn't quite say uh, that it was history. I, I mentioned a specific political culture shaped by history. This is what um, the German outlook. And doubtless, uh, looking at certain texts published today, and Hannah has also read them already, uh, some reckoning is happening um, once the aggression is already underway. There's one more thing that I would add. I, in my opinion, if we're talking about history and the attitude towards World War II, we have to note that the way Russia never uh, made a reckoning after the war, Russia never um, settled its affairs with the past, uh, with September 17th and what the Red Army did, aside from Memorial. And we see that this has practical consequences. Their imperialist thinking up still prevails. It's interesting to see how history is present uh, in the events of today. But then again, if we are talking about Germany's attitude towards Russia, uh, well, there's uh, all sorts of uh, statistics which uh, say that Poland and the Baltics, we have six times as much of an economic significance to Germany than Russia does. So at the level of the facts, it's a totally different picture. I've read several comments recently uh, saying that Germany's attitude towards Russia is emotional, psychological. It's a very deep, uh, irrational uh, reaction. So here we're analyzing Putin's attack, and we've been talking about Lukashenko and Putin saying that they're crazy, they're reckless, they're mad. But after all, there is some uh, calculation to this. There is a certain cultural slash historical context, continuity, and there's a mechanism in how the West treats Russia, uh, which involves a, a weakness, a psychological weakness, where a Poland, Ukraine, and Belarus, the Baltics, they all disappear. There's only Russia. As Rafael Utz once said about two years ago, uh, he talked about the beginning of Babylon Berlin, a movie about the Weimar Republic. There's a transport train heading for Germany, and it pulls out of Russia or the Soviet Union, and there's the German border. Nothing on the way. It just goes from the Soviet Union to Germany. That's how the directors of the filmmakers um, imagine those times. It's quite deep. So I hope that uh, some awakening will come. Um, it is uh, far overdue, but I hope it will lead to some practical solutions. But let's remember, three weeks ago, uh, about the attitude to Nord Stream, 57% of Germans said that they supported Nord Stream 2. And it's also something that politicians look at. We are in a terrible situation because in accordance with the newest research, a 70% of Russians Putin's policy towards Ukraine and over 50% of Germans believe that Nord Stream 2 uh, should, be, um, uh, should become operational. And in Mecklenburg uh, and Pomerania, uh, this percentage is even higher. I now have a question to Professor Gavin. I would like to ask you about uh, the notion of genocide that Putin has uh, referenced in his uh, speech, the legitimizing the use of violence in Ukraine. He said we have to enter the Donbass in order to prevent genocide. We have to demilitarize Ukraine. We have to uh, denazify um, Ukraine. And this is a term used in official Russian documents and repeated um, by Russian propaganda. So Russia states that its aim is to prevent genocide. Genocide is a notion in international law invented 
formulated by Raphael Lemkin at the Pilatsky Institute, um, does research um, into Lemkin's activity in the field of international law. This Orwellian manipulation, linguistic manipulation uh, by Putin, is it not a challenge to us, uh, to us as people who should ensure that definitions uh, stay what they are so that notions respond with reality? How can we oppose this Orwellian manipulation as the Pilatsky Institute, uh, whose mission is also to study Lankin? Wszystkich, prawda? To bezczelne odwoływanie się do terminu ukutego przez Rafała Lemkina. Well, I think this was very painful, well, to all of us. Um, in Lemkin's term, the idea was to, destro to destroy an ethnic group. And at the same time, Putin says Ukraine is not a nation. It does not enjoy a right to have its own state, statehood. So it's rather scandalous how he uses the term. But our moral um, outrage is not enough, I'm afraid. We need to see action. We need to be able to um, bring this manipulation to light. Well, what is it that we can do other than discuss the topic or promote the concept used by Rafael Lemkin, who died in utter poverty in 1854, I think, because well, his, his idea of genocide did not go back only to the Second World War and the Holocaust, but also to the activities of the Soviet Russia. And it is only evidence, evident if you look at his biography, if you research the documents, Lemkin did take up this issue. It was a challenge for him. Now, in the statement by Putin, what I found striking was that he said it point blank that he does not recognize Ukraine. He challenged the right of Ukraine to her own statehood. And Mr. Budish mentioned that Russia wants to neutralize Ukraine in a sort of cold analytical language. But there is one more consideration. What Putin wants to do is to destroy the Ukrainian statehood. He would want Ukraine to become a kind of people, People's Republic of Poland from the past that would, yes, carry the name Ukraine, but would really not be a Ukrainian state as such in its own right. So this is perhaps something that Putin uh, thinks of. I mean, the Soviet uh, domination in uh, Poland started in the same manner. You know, the system was imposed. It remained under control. The question is how far can he go in achieving this in Ukraine? I know we cannot be sure, but is this where he's going? Well, the Finlandization of Ukraine would only be possible once the adequate conditions um, were to be met. If the West agrees, that's the chief prerequisite. We are pressed for time, I'm afraid, but I would like to raise a number of fundamental issues without going perhaps too much into the detail, which are obviously uh, fascinating. But my question goes to Marek Budish. Does the war in Ukraine change the geopolitical situation of Poland? If it does, how exactly? Well, our situation deteriorated before the war started. Please note that the dislocation of the military from the easternmost region to Belarus effectively means that there must have been a decision reached between Putin and Lukashenko that the army would stay in Belarus 
Brześcia, bo tam one będą... And near Brześć, this is Brest, this is where they, they were stationed. At the same time, the Belarusian army was to be further equipped, further modernized. We should bear in mind that Belarusians spent about 1.2 to 1.5% of their GDP recently, and given the volume of Belarusian GDP, that was not a significant amount. But now they were going to receive an injection of equipment. Uh, they were to share the reconnaissance and command systems. Uh, the Belarusian army numbers about 50,000 men, soldiers and commissioned officers is to be remodeled to follow the Russian model in terms of the uh, military effectiveness, its capacity. I think within two or three years, the Belarusian military will be further supported, reinforced by Russia. And what we refer to as the eastern flank of the NATO will be put out of equilibrium um, because the situation was different when the only possible threat was the Western military region. Now there would be another military grouping there. If Ukraine were to come under the domination of Russia, then the southern military region would move further closer to the Polish border, which will, of course, further deteriorate the situation of Poland. Allow me to factor in yet another consideration here. We talk about certain ambivalence on the part of Germany, also France, Western Europe in general. Now, this is not entirely irrational because the perception of threat is different there. The Russian military has the possibility of projecting power over the distance of approximately 300 kilometers from the borderline of Russia. They cannot go farther. They do not have enough logistics um, and supplies to make it happen. Therefore, Berlin does not feel threatened. Uh, or Paris, for that matter, in a military sense of the word. And Alphonse Mice, today, the, the, the commander in chief of the, of the German military uh, commented on that today. It is only rational on their part. If Germany were to rebuild its military capacity, they would have to spend not 1.5% of GDP, but 3%, and not over one year, but over many years. And according to the analysis of the uh, strategic think tank, Institute for Strategic Studies, the whole Europe, in order to rebuild its military capacity and not just rely on America, over the time span of 10 to 15 years, that's the time you need, from 288 to 350 billion dollars. That is the rationale for which Berlin, Paris, or Rome, for that matter, is not keen on reaching this kind of decision because that would have to remodel the entire social, political, and economic um, system in each of these states. Of course, uh, the Ah, there is public opinion, which is more peacefully minded, but and that is consideration too. But there obviously is a very cold calculation behind that. Uh, on the one hand, um, it's a free lunch offered by the US, but on the other hand, they are not under threat. It is the Central Europe, it is the Balkans. Uh, Russia will not go as far as Berlin. Russia will not introduce its political order in Berlin, uh, France, Italy, for that matter. So it is only rational for them to act as they do. And I think we should 
we should understand that. Now, the exclusion of Russia from the uh, political game in Europe because of the infringements of the international law, because of the violation of peaceful coexistence. Now, isn't that perhaps of benefit to Poland? But this has not yet happened. The Financial Times today uh, has written that that uh, Scholz, uh, but also the representatives of Italy and Hungary are against excluding Russia from the SWIFT clearing system. You know, some of them argue that Russia has been a reliable partner supplying natural gas to Germany for 40 years now. The position of the Austrian government is also quite clear. So for the sake of our debate, I think we should uh, set apart slogans which are used by the media from the real activities. Indeed, Scholz blocked the certification of Nord Stream. Uh, this is an important move. But then he's blocking the expulsion of Russia from the SWIFT system, so the sanction would not be effective. And now we have to wait until the uh, Madrid summit in June, and then we'll see what happens. Let me remind you what happened the last time around. France blocked the establishment of a shared NATO fund, which was going to support the expansion of warehouses and transport routes on the eastern flank of, of NATO. If this happens again, that will be our reality. That would speak volume. Minister Katzenbauer has um, written, she actually wrote it today, that she is very moved by what she's seeing and by the decisions of Bundeswehr. But these are quite pathetic actions. Now, Khodorkovsky, uh, who is well versed in the economic reality, a former CEO of UCOS spoke a few weeks ago on the expulsion of Russia from SWIFT. He said that would not come as a blow, as a major blow uh, to, to Russia. It is only a way of clearing accounts and that uh, this solution should not be you know, mystified or, or demonized. What would hurt Russia? would be to abandon the Russian supplies of fuels, because 50% of Russian budget um, comes from the sale of the uh, energy sources. I think we need to be wrapping up, but I have a question to Dr. Adamski about the consequences of the Ukrainian war on the Polish-Ukrainian relations. Is, is that going to mark some change? Well, yes, the, the change will be significant as long as uh, we uh, will see a sovereign Ukrainian state in the first place. We are not certain at this stage if Russia is going to go for compromise and will leave the right to appoint the Ukrainians' authorities independently, or they may want to find the Ukrainian figurehead and appoint him or her. This is something that Americans are warning warning against. Mm, we, we, we had that in the history of Poland when Augustus III was thus appointed against the will of the uh, Polish nobility. But if the Ukrainian state remains unoccupied, at least in the West and Central Ukraine, then I'm convinced that the spirit of support and collaboration between Poland and Ukraine will shape a good climate between the two states for decades. 
the even the Polish trolls, the anti-Bandera characters, and in this discussion, I was engaged myself because many Ukrainians asked me for assistance, um, and I would tell them that they. Ukrainians can come to Poland. The grandparents do not have to carry a passport on them. The, the, the journalists, Ukrainian journalists, are so happy to see so much support from Poland. And that is certainly going to translate into good relations between the two countries in the years to come. But we are going to see a wave of Ukrainian immigration into Poland. And that is going to impact social relations between us. It would be catastrophic if Putin um, were to turn Ukraine into another Belarus. I don't think he's going to be strong enough to do that, uh, but we are already seeing that our assessments of Putin's actions have failed us. We underestimated his capacity to take risk and his determination. Uh, to leave behind him a very bloody um, heritage uh, and these racist concepts of um, zones of influence or replacing international law by the law of the fourth. Uh, to conclude the discussion, let me put the question to Professor um, Um uh, uh, There is a question from one of the participants, um, Mr. Vichar, who asks for an interpretation of Chancellor Scholz, who said today that this is not Russia's war, this is Putin's war. Yes, I just had a look at that question, and it seems to uh, be woven in with what we've been alluding to. Uh, we've said that some reckoning has started, critical thinking about mistakes made in Germany's policy towards Russia, um, but it's only a start, but there is quite a strong emphasis in German society, especially in Eastern Germany, in the SPD, and also to the left of SPD, there's quite a, a big pro-Russian front, and Chancellor Schultz, who is not a strong figure, who would define political directions, who would set the political trends. He's more of a type to accommodate uh, to others. I think he is trying to avoid uh, stating things clearly. It's easier uh, to beat around the bush, even though in the statement he did speak of Russia. He did say that Russia is responsible. Nonetheless, I think What's behind it is the thought that we will always come to terms with Russia. Uh, we'll always reach agreement with Russia, especially in light of the statistics which speak of 70% support for the actions in Ukraine, which is higher, uh, even higher than the support uh, given to Putin and his team. In other surveys. But let's re recall, let's keep one thing in mind. In totalitarian states like Russia or Belarus, we do need to uh, take into account that those survey results might be um, um, might not be accurate. I do believe that most Russians are politically infantile or imperialist, but definitely not 70%. Uh, Professor uh, Gavin, I would like to give you the floor just uh, to sum up our discussion. 
I think that we are at a turning point in history. We have been expecting it, though we weren't sure, but it's certainly the case that certain condition, conditions occurred that strengthened Russia, and it's alarming. Um, had Western Europe uh, really thought about its policy towards Russia, um, including the EU, and today we talked about rational and irrational things, there is a certain rationality uh, to um, these elites which use a communal rhetoric in their public pronouncements, but it's uh, uh, we need to uh, keep um, Eastern Europe in mind. We will follow the events, also the discussions in the West, also Germany's stance towards Russia, and we are uh, keeping our fingers crossed for Ukraine and for the Ukrainian people. I think that we will meet uh, more often nowadays. Um, we are living through dramatic events. I think that this is one of the more, most important moments in history. A moment which, in my view, it won't be decisive. It won't decide Russian-Ukrainian relations, but it may, in fact, be the beginning of a wider a geopolitical game and that will uh, shape future decades, including for Poland. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you to all of our participants. Thank you uh, to all of the attendees who have followed us on Facebook. And despite uh, the situation, I wish you all a good night. And hopefully the situation will develop in a positive direction. Thank you very much. Thank you.